this this talk is being supported by the Acopian Center for the Environment and the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, right? And I really appreciate um, that that uh, you gave me the opportunity to come here. This is this is coming right at the end of my Fulbright. I've been in Tbilisi um, since October first, and I'm going home on April first, which is what twelve days away or something. Um, and I'm I'm excited to go home. <laughs> it's been a long. It, it, it's been a great experience for me, but um, I have a, a wife and daughter at home, and I miss them. They came to visit me in the middle, um, but you know I'm ready to go home now. I've accomplished what I needed to accomplish, <laughs> and now I can return home feeling satisfied. But this talk today is um, my last big commitment and and uh, kind of the culmination of my work here. So. I'm, I'm really happy, happy for the opportunity to do this because I've been teaching courses about climate change and other environmental issues. Like I, I teach a class on eco-poetry. Um, in fact, I taught one on eco-poetry in uh, at, at Ilias State University in Tbilisi for, for master's students in the fall semester. Um, but it's the first time I've written anything about it. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have this opportunity to have written something that I'm presenting and you know could potentially turn into a publication someday. So I'm, I'm grateful for, for being here. All right, I'll get started. Um, so as I wrote in my description for this talk, it's not only scientists that, that have been expressing concern uh, over anthropogenic climate change, uh, but artists as well have, including filmmakers, novelists, poets, musicians, and photographers. Um, and often their works combine the insights of science fiction with the reality of environmental disaster, showing us what the future might hold for humankind and for the planet. Uh, some critics and readers have started to call this new genre cli-fi, uh, and that's a term that I'll explain shortly. Uh, my argument in this talk is that arts and humanities are essential for engaging our imaginations on the issue of climate change. So it's one thing to encounter data on the increase of global average temperatures or the rise of sea levels, but it's another to read a short story or novel from the perspective of a climate refugee, hear a song about species extinction, or see the shore of a Pacific island washing away before your own eyes in a film or photograph. And the same thing with glaciers. The, I, I, I don't mention this in my talk, but there's a, a great documentary called Chasing Ice uh, about a National Geographic photographer documenting uh, glacial depletion. And I really recommend it if you haven't seen that. So before I get into some examples, now this is not moving forward. Ah, there we go, thank you. Uh, before I get into some examples of artworks that depict climate change, uh, I want to explore briefly how literary critics and theorists think about environmental literature in general and about literature and climate change in particular. This is a vast topic, uh, but I want to make a couple of simple points about it. First, one should understand that when we talk about ecological criticism or eco-criticism, uh, what, what we have in mind is the area of literary studies that examines the relationship between literature and the physical in environment. Um, so I've put this book up here, uh, by, edited by Cheryl Blatfelty, and in her introduction to this book, she explains that um, all ecological criticism shares the fundamental premise that human culture is connected to the physical world, affecting and affected by it. Ecocriticism takes as its subject the interconnections between nature and culture. And um, she wrote these thoughts about eco-criticism way back in 1996. That's when this book was published. Uh, but her observations remain relevant today, perhaps even more relevant than ever, since the stakes have become clearer. How culture interacts with nature is perhaps the most fundamental question of our time. And as Glottfelty explains, reading environmental literature carefully and conscientiously can help us think about that nature-culture nexus. An ecologically focused criticism, she writes, is a worthy enterprise primarily because it directs our attention to matters about which we need to be thinking. 
Consciousness raising is its most important task. For how can we solve environmental problems unless we start thinking about them? What I think makes literature and other art forms useful is exactly this consciousness raising quality. And that's why I've given my talk the title Conceiving of Climate Change. Uh, the purpose of ecologically themed arts is not primarily to communicate knowledge or facts, though they can do that as well, but to fire our imaginations and to prompt us to conceive of possible outcomes. That is to work through the implications of knowledge and facts. The term sci-fi uh, dates to 2007, uh, when it was coined by a blogger named Dan Bloom. And he's very, you know, uh, adamant that he gets credit for coining this <laughs> term. Um, but the term really picked up steam in 2013 when this uh, NPR piece aired. And a, a number of other uh, media outlets ran articles um, using the term cli-fi and applying it to novels that had been recently published. Um, and the term is modeled on the word sci-fi, right? Uh, and just replacing the first syllable with cli, right? So instead of sci-fi, cli-fi, and cli, of course, refers to climate. So in essence, cli-fi novels are works of science fiction that depict the future after anthropogenic climate change. And anthropogenic, if, if you don't know this term, it basically it means caused by humans, <laughs> right? Uh, those works are primarily what I'm discussing today, but I want to broaden the term out to include other genres and media, not just novels. Um, by the way, sometimes when you see it, in some of these articles, when you see uh, the term cli-fi defined, they'll say cli-fi stands for climate fiction. And I avoid that because I feel there's a danger of being misunderstood. You know that that it may have something to do with with uh, climate denialism. You know, saying that climate change is a fiction. That's not at all <laughs> what this is about. Um, writing for the Chronicle of Higher Education in 2013, Rio Fernandez explained that the newly recognized genre often depicts a grim future of a changed world, portraying how humanity must deal with years of environmental neglect. These portrayals typically show us not where we are now, but where we might be headed. The NPR segment on the screen featured Nathaniel Rich's 2013 novel, Odds Against Tomorrow. And the author, who incidentally is also an environmental reporter for the New York Times, was interviewed for the radio broadcast. In the piece, the NPR reporter explained that over the past decade, more and more writers have, been, have begun to set their novels and short stories in worlds not unlike our own, where the Earth systems are noticeably off kilter. The genre has come to be called climate fiction, cli-fi for short. She then quotes Rich, who says, I think we need a new type of novel to address a new type of reality, which is that we're headed towards something terrifying and large and transformative. And it's the novelist's job to try to understand what is that doing to us? So notice the emphasis on thinking. If the novelist's task is to conceive of ecological impacts as we might experience them, it becomes the reader's task as well. Richard Crownshaw, a senior lecturer who teaches a course on cli-fi at the University of London, claims that these novels are a tool to explore how climate change is continually subjected to a form of cognitive dissonance. And therefore, the novel can change how we sometimes fail to think about climate change or displace the problem onto future generations. <clears throat> I think the point that Crownshaw is making here is that uh, when he refers to cognitive dissonance is that in climate change conversations, there's often a gap between long-term and short-term thinking. Cli-fi works can make near or distant futures become something we can experience with immediacy. So they serve to close that gap. Often those futures are terrifying, or at least unnerving, but even alarming potential outcomes can serve to engage us in the present. Ted Howell explains that the worlds in these books are very dystopian, but they're also meant to frighten you into action, like the vast majorities of dystopias do. Still, cli-fi novels tend to offer some glimmer of hope, some solution glimpsed from the future that we can apply in the present. But before I discuss hope, 
um, I think we should examine how these works depict the problem or situation of, of climate change. Um, I'll get into literary fiction and other art forms in a moment, but first I want to introduce the notion that nonfiction contain idea, can contain ideas, not only facts and data, that can be quite powerful in how we think about climate change and other ecological issues. Uh, I think the best example of this is Bill, Bill McKibben's classic, The End of Nature, which was published in 1989 and is famously the first book about global warming written for a general audience. His central idea is actually expressed in the book's title, and I think it's a profound one. Um, and I'll read a bit from one relevant section to explain what Bill, McKibben's, what Bill McKibben means when he says that nature for us has already met its end. He writes, almost every day I hike up the hill out my back door. Within a hundred yards, the woods swallows me up and there's nothing to remind me of human society. No trash, no stumps, no fence, not even a real path. And by the way, I'm pretty sure he lives in Vermont, so if you can picture the Vermont woods. Looking out from the high places, you, you can't see a road or house. It is a world apart from man. But once in a while, someone will be cutting wood farther down the valley, and the snarl of a chainsaw will fill the woods. It is harder on those days to get caught up in the timeless meaning of the forest, for man is nearby. The sound of the chainsaw doesn't blot out all the noises or the for of the forest or drive the animals away, but it does drive away the feeling that you are in another separate, timeless, wild sphere. You may have guessed that the sound of the chainsaw here is a metaphor. Uh, truly wild spaces are ever more rare on the planet. Uh, I happen to live near one, the wilderness of Olympic National Park in the US Pacific Northwest, which they say is one of the only places in the lower 48 states where you can enjoy the nearly untouched natural environment without seeing an aircraft fly overhead. But sounds and sights are not the only phenomena that can interrupt our experience of wilderness. McKibben writes, now that we have changed the most basic forces around us, the noise of that chainsaw will always be in the woods. We have changed the atmosphere and that will change the weather. Once the chemistry of the atmosphere has been altered by human technology, nature is never actually natural, no matter how far you get from chainsaws or contrails. The place may look the same, but we now know that the temperature might be a few degrees warmer or colder than it would have been without human impacts, or that precipitation might have made the place a little wetter or drier than it would have been without us. As I said, I find McKibben's idea to be profound, and it has changed every outdoors experience I've had since I encountered it. Each apparently pristine landscape now has an uncanny quality. <laughs> we can never get away from our civilization. It's inextric inextricably tied up with its environment. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about some examples um, from Cli-Fi Works. I just wanna keep an eye on the time here. We're still good, I think. <laughs> um, all right, uh, unlike much traditional science fiction, cli-fi works are sometimes just a few steps ahead of us in time, and they can therefore reveal particularly unsettling or frightening possible realities. Nathaniel Rich's Odds Against Tomorrow, which I mentioned earlier, is one such example. The book describes a catastrophic flood in Manhattan after a hurricane hits, and it was ironically coming into print right as Hurricane Sandy pummeled the same area. Reality and fiction almost met. Another excellent cli-fi novel is Barbara Kingsolver's Flight Behavior from 2012, so just a year earlier than Rich's novel, which is a character-driven narrative that hinges on a species displaced from its traditional habitat. And I won't tell you which species. It's a, it's a really good novel, but uh, the, the, the particular species is a big part of the story, and it's kind of it's revealed to you gradually as you as you read it. So I don't want to spoil it if you haven't read it. Um, and King Solver is just an amazing writer. Jenny Offel's Weather, uh, published in 2020, is a, per is a first person novel from the perspective of a graduate student who's hired by her former mentor 
to answer emails and carry out research for a podcast called Hell and High Water. Uh, in the process, she grants us direct access to her own climate anxieties at a, at a personal level, which even though not much really happens in the plot, I find to be one of the most relatable, and this is a student, my, a word my students love to use in their papers, <laughs> one of the most relatable novels about climate change in the present. Um, another notable clarify work is the 2017 film Downsizing, by, uh, directed by Alexander Payne, where Matt Damon and his fellow cast members literally shrink their physical bodies in order to shrink their carbon footprints. That's a really cool movie if you haven't seen it. It's a comedy as well, a very dark comedy. But when it, com when it comes to showing conceivable near futures, perhaps my favorite example is Kim Stanley Robinson's 2020 novel, The Ministry for the Future, a big book that contains many plot strands and even nonfiction sections. The story opens with a chapter told from the perspective of Frank May, an, an American aid worker at a clinic in India in the late 1920s, I'm uh, sorry, the late 2020s, <laughs> wrong century. So uh, in the future from us right now, uh, but not far in the future, uh, during a historic heat wave. The narrator sets the scene as morning arrives and the day heats up. And then the sun cracked the eastern horizon. It blazed like an atomic bomb, which of course it was. The fields and buildings underneath that brilliant chip of light went dark, then darker still, as the chip flowed to the sides in a burning line that then bulged to a crescent he couldn't look at. The heat coming from it was palpable, a slap to the face. Solar radiation heating the skin of his face, making him blink. Stinging eyes flowing, he couldn't see much. Everything was tan and beige, beige and a brilliant, unbearable white. Ordinary town in Uttar Pradesh, 6 a.m. He looked at his phone, 38 degrees. In Fahrenheit, that was, he tapped, 103 degrees. Humidity, about 35%. The combination was the thing. A few years ago, it would have been among the hottest wet bulb temperatures ever recorded. Now, just a Wednesday morning. Frank offers shelter to the local population, but it's not long before deaths begin to occur, first among the very old and the very young. Eventually, Frank convinces the group to move to a local lake. Sometime after sunset, as the quick, this is a quote, sometime after sunset, as the quick twilight passed and darkness fell, they all got in the water. It just felt better. Their bodies told them to do it. But the temperature of the water is not much cool, was not much cooler than the air the temperature of the air, and their bodies their bodies begin to overheat. Again, some begin to die, and Frank can do nothing for them. Robinson continues, many years passed for Frank that night. When the sky lightened, he stirred. His fingertips were all pruny. He had been poached, slow boiled. He was a cooked thing. It was hard to raise his head an inch. Possibly, he would drown here. The thought caused him to exert himself. He dug his elbow in, raised himself up. He sat up. The air was still hotter than the water. He watched sunlight strike the tops of the trees on the other side of the lake. It looked like they were bursting into flame. Balancing his head carefully on his spine, he surveyed the scene. Everyone was dead. And this, this is the opening chapter of the book, and it, and it becomes something that um, I mean, essentially, he has PTSD after this, and he and he has to think through a, a, a lot of survivor's guilt. Like why why is it that he survived? And he and partly he thinks it's because he may have been healthier than the locals as a foreigner. He um, may have been better hydrated, and so on. Although it is a personal one for Frank, the world is also watching this tra tragedy. And as the novel proceeds, Robinson introduces many different responses to it, from an Indian initiative to introduce sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere to deflect solar energy, 
to an international effort to organize governments to battle climate change. And that's the, the ministry of the book's title, the ministry for the future. Um, to an anonymous radical environmental organization that carries out direct action against corporations and individuals. Somewhat similar to the Earth Liberation Front, if you know that organization. Uh, reading Robinson's opening chapter, I was reminded of Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence, where he describes the creeping nature of environmental problems like climate change, which inevitably impact the poor in developing nations more than the affluent in the developed world. Nixon writes, we are accustomed to conceiving violence as immediate and explosive, erupting into instant concentrated visibility. But we need to revisit our assumptions and consider the relative invisibility of slow violence. I mean a violence that is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but instead incremental, whose calamitous repercussions are postponed for years or decades or centuries. Nixon claims that we have a temporal bias for the spectacular and immediate, which may explain why we have been slow to take action to remediate climate change. But in scenes like the one I've quoted from Robinson's novel, the impact on readers may help them to imagine just how bad things could get and, be, and perhaps to take action. In fact, the impact on readers is equivalent to the impact on Frank and we can see as the novel proceeds how his choices are shaped by his traumatic experience in India. Um, as I've already hinted, I, I think the cli-fi category should be broadened to apply not only to literature, but to all art that imagines an ecological future, particularly a damaged future. Uh, one can find countless examples in different art forms, but I will offer just a few. Uh, among the most disturbing is a 2015 song by Anoni, formerly of the group Anthony uh, and the Johnsons. Um, and I have to, I have to just have a, explain something here. Um, writing this paragraph was a little tricky for me uh, because Anoni is a, a transgender woman, um, and back when she was in Anthony and the Johnsons. I knew her as a man <laughs> and I knew her voice as a man's voice. So I think I have the pronouns right here now, but if they slip, <laughs> that's the reason. Um, so formerly of the group Anthony and the Johnsons, Anoni, she sings here from the point of view of a sadistic, short-sighted persona who seems to care only for their immediate desires, their own immediate desires. This is a character that she's singing. The extinction of other species in particular does not concern this persona. And then I'll, I'll read you some of the lyrics and, and then I'll play you the section of the song that has these lyrics. Uh, so she sings, I wanna hear the dogs crying for water. I wanna see fish go belly up in the sea. All those lemurs and all those tiny creatures, I wanna see them burn. It's only four degrees. And all those rhinos and all those big mammals, I want to see them lying, crying in the fields. I want to see them burn. It's only four degrees. So now I'll play you this song, this part of it. Want to be a little louder? Yeah. Oops, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was escaped. Yeah, I didn't know that it would. Okay, let's we'll start again. Okay, here we go for real this time. <laughs> so
So you, I think you get the idea. It's actually a really beautiful song uh, and devastating in its content. Like I, 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 when I hear this song, I, I, on the one hand, I, I kind of enjoy it, but on the other, I just think, what an awful person this is. Um, not, not all Clifi works uh, seek to disturb their readers or listeners, like Anoni's song or Robinson's novel. Some use pathos to lead us toward justice. Um, in 2008, Bill, Bill McKibben, so this is the, the author of, of The End of Nature, is very active. So I'm sure some of you know who he is, right? He's, yeah. he's everywhere, it seems to be. It, it's, uh, I, I don't know how he manages to do everything he does. Um, so Bill McKibben, with funding from his organization, 350.org, which in the 350 refers to the uh, parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, and we're way above that. I think we're above 400 now, right? Four. Um, but the goal of the organization is to bring it down to 350. So with funding from his organization, he brought together two young women, young women poets, uh, from places that may be among the first to be significantly impacted by climate change. Um, and I, I'm sure I'll mispronounce their names, but Eka Niviana from the coast of Greenland, she's in the middle, and then Kathy Jetnal Kijiner from the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. Um, together, these two women wrote a poem that's a plea to their readers around the world to act. Um, and here are the closing lines of that poem. The very same beasts that now decide who should live and who should die. We demand that the world see beyond their oil, their oil slicked dreams, beyond the belief that tomorrow will never happen. Let me bring my home to yours, and so my islands to your island, the Marshall Islands to Greenland. Let's watch as Miami, New York, Shanghai, Amsterdam, London, Rio de Janeiro, and Osaka try to breathe underwater. None of us is immune. Life in all forms demands the same respect we all give to money. So each and every one of us has to decide if we will rise. Um, unsurprisingly, it's young people like Niviana and Jetnil Kijiner who have been leading actions against climate change. Among the best known young climate activists in the world is Greta Thunberg. Um, I'm a fan <laughs> from Sweden, who famously berated government representatives at the UN General Assembly in New York in 2019. <clears throat> she spoke to them as a brave and angry youth, a child really, to her elders. And here's what she said in that speech. Your generation is failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now is where we draw the line. The world is waking up and change is coming, whether you like it or not. Shortly after her speech, a musician named John Mollusk transformed the footage into a heavy metal music video, which has become for me a classic of the cli-fi genre. So this is, you can see the footage is from the PBS NewsHour, but this musician um, put this audio track over it, transformed her voice. You'll see what he did. <laughs>
I'm just realizing that I think I think I quoted a different speech, <laughs> but the anger is still there. Um, but it's interesting at the end he gave her her voice back. Yes, yes, yeah, it is interesting. So uh, the genre of Swedish death metal corresponds, and she's Swedish, of course, corresponds to the anger that Thunberg expressed in her speech. Um, in a way, the video is fun, or perhaps even funny which is why it was immediately shared on social media. Uh, but it's also poignant because it, it captures her desperation and fury perfectly. Okay, just let me just check the time here. Um, still good, I think? So um, it's not only artists, but um, when I was conceiving of this talk, conceiving of climate change, um, I was thinking about the arts, but also about the humanities. And it's, I, I wanted to be sure to have a, a section here where I talk about some other aspects of the humanities. So it's not only artists, but other humanists who contribute to the conversation about ecology. Philosophers and religious thinkers in particular have been engaged in the conversation. At its essence, climate change is a moral issue. A person's lifestyle choices or complicity in shared systems can result in harm being done to others. What is one's ethical responsibility to those others, whether human or non-human? Perhaps the most visible of these thinkers is Pope Francis, whose 2015 encyclical Laudato Si defines integral ecology as an approach that integrates questions of justice in the debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Similarly, a multinational group called the Islamic Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Sciences released the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change in the same year as the Pope's encyclical, 2015, arguing that there is a moral obligation towards conservation grounded in passages from the Quran. Evangelical Christians and other Protestants as, as well have been making the case for environmental sustainability and stewardship. As a literary scholar, I find Jonathan Safran Foer's 2019 book, We Are the Weather, uh, the, most, the most interesting of these theological and philosophical approaches to climate change. Foer is a fiction writer as well. Uh, have any of you read his novels? He wrote uh, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, kind of, uh, about 9-11. Um, and then Everything is Illuminated, a, a novel that's set in... in uh, was well, setting both in New York and in Ukraine around the time of the Second World War, sort of investigating his family's Jewish roots and what happened to them during the Second World War. These are really good novels. Um, and I think some of his nonfiction is just as good. So he uses his novelist tools in this book, uh, maybe placing it in the category of creative nonfiction, um, but only in the sense that he's using those tools. I mean, it, it's it's this this is a nonfiction book. The lengthy central section of the book is called Dispute with the Soul, where Foer has an extended dialogue with himself, no doubt in the Platonic tradition, about his own choices as a consumer, citizen of the world, and flawed moral person. Um, and I should say, I mentioned that he's Jewish, and, and a lot of what he's doing here uh, in the book has to do with Jewish ethics. Um, so... Bower asks himself in this dialogue whether true change is even possible. He writes, and the first voice here is his voice, and then his soul is responding. Um, I don't know how I've gotten this far, learned this much, convinced myself this thoroughly of the need to change, and yet still doubt that I'll change. Are you hopeful? So now he's, he's asking his soul, and his soul is the one in italics on the screen here. So the, the soul replies, that you'll change? that humankind will figure this out. We've already figured it out, that we will act on what we figured out. Have you noticed how often conversations about climate change end with the question of hopefulness? Have you noticed how often conversations about climate change end? That's because we feel hopeful and are comfortable putting off the discussion. No, it's because we feel hopeless and are uncomfortable discussing it. Either way, it's hope that allows the subject of climate change to be eclipsed in news and politics, in our lives, by more urgent issues. If you were a doctor, would you ask a cancer patient if he's hopeful? I might, 
Positivity seems to improve recovery. If you were a doctor, would you ask a cancer patient if he was hopeful without also asking what course of treatment he planned to take? No, probably not. And what if he planned to do nothing at all? Would you ask him if he was hopeful then? I might ask if he was depending on a miracle or just expecting death. Personally, I don't believe in miracles. <laughs> so what strikes me about this passage is the prospect of death, whether civilizational or planetary. Clifi shows us these possibilities, ideally, I think, so that we can avoid them. Um, when Clifi works, allow us to look further into the future, more than mere years or decades ahead of the present. Uh, ahead of the present. So you remember, uh, Ministry for the Future, it began just maybe five years from now. But some of these Clifi works go way further into the future. And when we look that far, we can see just how bad our situation could become. Novels like J.G. Ballard's The Drowned World from 1962 and George Turner's The Sea and Summer from 1987 show humanity struggling with sea levels many meters higher than they are now. And Margaret Atwood's time capsule found on a dead planet reveals an earth that has become completely unlivable. Um, At least all wells were poisoned, she writes. All rivers ran with filth. All seas were dead. There was no land left to grow food. Her story is intended as a found document, a message in a time capsule found by visitors to our planet from another, from another planet. You who have come here from some distant world to this dry lakeshore and cairn, to this cylinder of brass, in which on the last day of all our recorded days, I place our final words, pray for us who once too thought we could fly. Obviously, when a planet's resources are finite, they must be managed carefully. In Atwood's story, mismanagement leads to our demise, but in other Clifi works, it can lead in another direction. A common trope in science fiction is leaving the planet to resettle elsewhere in the universe. And that trope figures into Clifi works as well. One thinks especially of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower from 1993 and Parable of the Talents, 1998, where a new religion called Earthseed involves disseminating life on Earth to other planets, uh, all life, not only human life. Uh, Or Ursula Le Guin's Hainish Cycle, especially her 1972 novella, The Word for World is Forest. Uh, And by the way, the film Avatar totally ripped off like that (laughs) whole story. Uh, And in Word for World is Forest, uh, humans travel to another planet to clear cut forests and and ravage the local indigenous population. Um, So another of my favorite poets, Tracy K. Smith, she was poet laureate, I think, maybe two laureates ago in in the U.S. And she also has some poems in in this book. By the way, her father was a NASA um, researcher, a NASA scientist, and he worked on the Hubble telescope. So some of the poems are in this book are about the Hubble telescope and her father. Uh, But she also has has some poems about leaving Earth, um, imagining this future where we've destroyed the planet and we have to get to another one. Um, And one of those poems, I don't I think I don't have it. Yeah, I don't have it on. I don't have the text here, but I'll just read it to you. So she's the poem is called At Some Point They'll Want to Know What It Was Like. And they means people in the future who are asking questions about us leaving Earth. So here's a section from her poem. There was something about how it felt, not just the during, that rough churn of bulk and breath, limb and tooth, the mass of us, the quickness we made and rode but mostly the before, the waiting, knowing what would become, pang, then pleasure, then the underwater ride of after, thrown off like a coat over a bridge. Somehow you'd just give away what you'd die without. You just gave. The best was having nothing, no hope, no name in the throat, and finding the breath in you, the body, to ask. Um, And some of you may know this song, by Neil Young, After the Gold Rush. Um, by the way, I couldn't get the album version on YouTube, so this is a live performance from the year the album came out, in Carnegie Hall, 1970. Um, and before I play you the song, I'll, I'll read you uh, the section of the lyrics that I'll, I'll play for you, just so you can think about the text before you hear it. 
Um, so again, this is about leaving Earth. So Neil Young sings, I dreamed I saw the silver spaceships flying in the yellow haze of the sun. In the, of the sun, there were children crying and colors flying all around the chosen ones. All in a dream, all in a dream, the loading had begun, flying Mother Nature's silver seed to a new home in the sun. Flying Mother Nature's silver seed to a new home. Okay, so now I'll play you this song. Um, one of the things that this uh, non-album version doesn't have is like the coolest French horn solo <laughs> that I've ever heard in rock music. So it's worth looking up the album version later because that French horn solo I just think is wonderful. I mean, French horn, it's just an underappreciated instrument outside of the classical world. But, you know, in, in, uh, in rock music, you don't encounter it. Um, and notice here the seed metaphor, right? Flying, flying Mother Nature's silver seed to a new home in the sun. And um, that same metaphor, I, I mentioned Octavia Butler with the, the earth seed, this religion about disseminating earth, Earth's life to other planets um, because we're destroying our own. Um, um, it, the seed metaphor comes up in lots of Clafi works. Another one is Odds Against Tomorrow, the novel by Nathaniel Rich, where at the very, maybe I don't know if I should, this is a spoiler, I suppose. Maybe I won't say too much about it, but as the novel comes to a close, there's this recovery that's a um, uh, kind of regeneration that happens in New York City, which is totally destroyed by this hurricane and flood. Um, but part of it is settlers coming back into the city and and uh, growing organic gardens and farms. So this is, this, like I said, the seed metaphor is something you often encounter in these works. All right, moving into my conclusion now. Um, this, this is the part about hope, right? All climate change presentations have to end with something hopeful. <laughs> it's become something of a cliche for books, articles, and documentaries about climate change to end with an obligatory message of hope. And yet I find that the doom and gloom of cli-fi requires that we consider what to do in a positive sense with our despair, or at least what to do with the prospect of despair. While I'm not generally an optimistic person when it comes to climate change, I do believe in the ability of people to organize, as well as in the ability of works of art to have an impact on the culture and zeitgeist. Um, in fact, I think that by looking to past successes, we can imagine future ones. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's 1852 novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, for instance, energized the abolitionist movement. And Upton Sinclair's The Jungle from 1906 led to increased workers' protections in the meatpacking industry. Even more pertinent is Rachel Carson's 1962 book Silent Spring, which documented the environmental damage done by the use of, the use of pesticides in agriculture and helped to reverse US policy on them including a complete ban on DDT in farming. Uh, even the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency is sometimes linked to Carson's book. Um, and similarly, so this was 1962. Similarly, in 1968, I'm sure you've seen this image, 
Uh, astronaut Bill Anders took this photo that's come to be called Earthrise. Um, looking back as, as this was the first uh, NASA um, space flight to orbit the moon. So not landing on the moon, but orbiting the moon. And he took this photograph. I, I, I've heard him in, in interviews talk about this and almost all the photographs he took were black and white photographs, but he had, I think, one roll of color film and just like on a whim, he put it in the camera and snapped this picture and it became this iconic image. Uh, and, and partly why it's iconic is that it energized the environmental movement because people could suddenly see the planet from relatively far away and see you know, how fragile it looked from, from a distance. Um, Jim Lovell, another astronaut who, who was on this mission, he said uh, at, at the time, um, the vast loneliness of space is awe-inspiring. And it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. Uh, just one year after Anders took this photograph, uh, Buckminster Fuller published his essay, Spaceship Earth, which he intended as an answer to the question, does humanity have a chance to survive lastingly and successfully on planet Earth? And if so, how? Uh, so he writes, our little spaceship Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter, which is almost a negligible dimension in the great vastness of space. Spaceship Earth was so extraordinarily well invented and designed that to our knowledge, humans have been on board it for 2 million years, not even knowing that they were on board a ship. And our spaceship is so superbly designed as to be able to keep life regenerating on board despite the phenomenon, entropy, by which all local systems lose energy. Um, he also writes in this essay that this craft of ours, this spaceship Earth, came with no instruction book, and we have to use our intellect in order to figure out how to operate it. And notice that this final metaphor here about entropy and um, um, the planet, the, the spaceship, it, it allows life to regenerate in spite of entropy, right? As long as we operate the ship correctly. Um, but of course, the implication is that we can screw it up and that we can damage these regenerative systems. Um, so in the wake of Silent Spring, the Earthrise photograph, uh, yeah, the Earthrise photograph and, and, um, and essays like this one, um, the first Earth Day happened in 1970, right? And, and, and it came, came about because of this rising environmental consciousness. So I think that if we look back to the 1960s, we can see ways that people organized and made things happen. And, and, and maybe we can resume that constructive collective work again. All right, to close, I'm going to play some of Chuck Johnson's instrumental piece, which is called Serotony. Um, and I find this piece to contain a, a hopeful message. It comes from his 2021 album, The Cinder Grove, which is a requiem for lost California landscapes, um, especially those that have been destroyed by wildfires. Before I encountered the piece, I had never before heard the word serotony. Have, have, have any of you heard the word serotony or serotonous? New, it was totally new to me. It comes from uh, plant biology. Um, I've since learned that it refers to plants that are late in their occurrence, development, or flowering. In particular, the term is often applied to plants that grow and repopulate the landscape in the wake of a wildfire, such as happens when the seeds of jack pines germinate after the fire's heat causes their cones to open. The regeneration is what you might think about as you listen to this piece. This is instrumental.
Um, by the way, the, the, you can see the title of this album is The Cinder Grove. Uh, I remember when I first saw that title, I didn't even notice <laughs> that it, it wasn't uh, a tree that was being named there because it sounds so much like cedar, mm -hmm. the cedar grove. But of course, this is a grove made of ashes, right, after okay. it's been burnt. Um, okay, so to, to, to continue with that metaphor of serotony, right, growth in, in the wake of a fire, Humanity has reached a point where the damage we've done to our environment is particularly appalling, but it may also be the point where new growth can lead us in a more sustainable direction. I think we're in the midst of a great awakening, particularly among younger generations, and if we all keep thinking, listening, and talking to one another, we may give ourselves reason for hope. Perhaps someday we'll reach a point where cli-fi novels and other art forms will be looked back upon and interpreted merely as fictions not as potential, potential, conceivable, terrifying futures. Thank you. And now, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Or, Thank you very much.